Are you one of the thousands of Canadians who has made money investing in real estate? If so, chances are you've owned a rental property or flipped houses. But how about investing in mobile homes? That's our topic this week here on the Maple Money Show. Rachel Hernandez is an author and real estate investor. As a former business-to-business sales executive for Fortune 500 corporations, Rachel has extensive training in the area of sales and marketing. With over a decade of experience, she spent several years as a landlord before taking the leap and specializing in mobile home investing. Rachel joins us this week to discuss the benefits of mobile home investing and how you can get started. Welcome to the Maple Money Show, the podcast that helps Canadians improve their personal finances to create lasting financial freedom. This episode of the Maple Money Show is brought to you by Willful. Did you know that 57% of Canadian adults don't have a will? Willful has made it more affordable, convenient, and easy for Canadians to create a legal will and power of attorney documents online from the comfort of home. In less than 20 minutes and for a fraction of the price of visiting a lawyer, you can gain peace of mind knowing you have a plan in place to protect your children, pets, and loved ones in the event of an emergency. Get started for free at maplemoney.com slash willful and use promo code maplemoney to save 15%. Now, let's chat with Rachel. Hi Rachel, welcome to the Maple Money Show. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me. I really appreciate it. First of all, I'm I'm not personally into real estate investing in general. It's not a topic I know a lot about. For me, real estate's buying my own house and that's as far as I've gone. <laughs> so <laughs> to kind of niche down even more, you do mobile home investing and it sounded interesting to me. It sounds uh, like maybe something that could be easier to get into because it's a smaller purchase price, but I'm sure there's a lot of things that are quite different compared to sort of, we'll call it regular real estate investing. Right. First of all, can you tell me what this looks like just as as a broad stroke of investing in mobile homes uh, compared to other options? Sure. For mobile home investing, it's a very specific niche. I will tell you that. It's one of those things that a lot of real estate investors don't really know about, Mm -hmm. or if they've heard about it in the past, they kind of gloss over it. And to be honest, there's kind of a negative stigma with mobile homes, aka manufactured homes, however you want to call them, because a lot of people look down on them. The first thing that comes into a lot of people's mind is that movie Eight Mile with Eminem. And they think that all mobile homes are like that and all mobile home communities are like that. They're not all like that, but there are communities like that. So in terms of mobile home communities, there's basically three main types of communities. You've got the trailer park, what you see in the movie Eight Mile with Eminem. That's a low end park. Then you've got a step higher and that's a middle of the road type park. And then you've got a step higher than that, which is a high end park. So in terms of communities, it's not that much different from the types of communities that you have in single family homes, apartment buildings, duplexes. There's, you know, your low end, middle of the road and the high high end type of communities. So there's that stigma in terms of competition. That's actually good for someone who wants to get into mobile home investing because there's less competition because most people don't know about it or even Mm -hmm. want to get into mobile home investing because of that stigma. But to answer your question, what I basically do is I buy mobile homes in communities. So these communities, the community owns the lot, the land where the mobile home sits, But the mobile homes can either be owned by an investor like me or an individual homeowner or the park themselves. So basically, I buy these homes, these mobile homes in these communities. I work in high-end communities and I buy them for cash. I sell them to people who want to live in that type of community and they buy the home from me then they rent the lot out from the mobile home park. So what are you doing in between? Is this sort of a, a flip? Like, are you, are you 
buying it and and fixing it up and selling it? Or what's the purpose of you buying it and then selling it? Sure. So basically what I do is I buy the home and then, yes, I do fix it up. I don't do a handyman special. I don't sell it as (laughs) is. That's just not the type of clientele I work with. And then I fix it up. And then once I have it on the market, I put it up on the market. And basically what I do is I work with people who actually eventually want to get into a home. So I do a lease with option to purchase Hmm. so that it gives people the option of purchasing the home if they'd like in the future. But at the same time, they're in a community that they want to live in. So that's where the lease is. So it's two separate agreements. You've got your lease agreement, and then you've got your option to purchase agreement. So if they'd like to purchase it, we have an agreement for that. And then they take care of it as if, you know, they're going to purchase the home, but they're not obligated to. So with these leases, I was looking at them uh just here in Airdrie in, in my, my local town. And they seem high. Uh, it, it was, it was roughly 650 to $700 a month to lease that land. And mm-hmm. now granted you're selling, so you're not stuck with the lease for a long time, but if you're trying to go the the rental route, be a landlord, it seems like that lease is kind of prohibitive. Like maybe that you could get a mortgage for an actual house and <laughs> with that extra money. Yeah, it would actually really depend on the area. So what I do, Tom, is I keep it in line with the rents in the area, the apartments. So whether it be a two bedroom or a three bedroom. So let's just say that a two bedroom in my area is going for $1,200 a month for an apartment. And so if I have a mobile home with the lot rent and the lease of my portion that they pay to me, all together, they're not going to pay more than $1,200 a month. And in some cases, I just do it a little bit less than market rent just to kind of entice you know, people to like, oh, yeah, okay, this is a good deal. And people are fine with that. But I, I typically don't go over market rent. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on what people, and I don't advise um, beginning real estate investors to do that, even though it sounds like, oh, the market's so hot right now and I can, I can get this amount. If that's not the market rent, you're going to really risk someone defaulting in the future. So I would just try to keep it at market rent. So the lot rent, the land that they pay the park and the rent that they pay to you, your payment, all of that together, I would just keep that at market rent or a little bit below market rent just to be on the safe side. Uh, So when you do this option to buy, what does that normally look like? Like, are they potentially renting from you for years or is it normally pretty, pretty quick that transfer over? It is up to them. So basically I give them an option for a certain period of time. And um, typically it's about 10 to 15 years. And between that time, they have the option of purchasing the home. Hmm. That's one agreement. And then we have uh, the certain price uh, for that agreement. Then we've got the lease and the lease is just basically, you're just leasing this, you know, this is basically your rent. Mm -hmm. So in the lease with option to purchase, I have it in there that while you're doing the lease, you know, you can actually earn credits for this purchase price that we agreed on. I'm very careful in terms of my wording. I don't say, you know, you have this rent and a certain amount comes from that credit because you don't want to make it seem like there's, you know, an equity stake. But I basically say you earn credits towards this purchase price. Mm -hmm. And at any time you want to know how many credits you've earned and how much the purchase price is on your balance, you can send a statement in writing. And I do everything in writing. I don't do any of that (laughs) over the phone text. (laughs) It's just a lot of back, too much back and forth. Well, it's a good point about the equity thing too, that so you, you have credits that are technically a valueless number it just happens to be that a credit's worth a dollar. <laughs> right, <laughs> then, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a very interesting way to do it. Uh, now, you mentioned before you you bring in, whether it's a, a tenant or someone to buy directly, you fix the place up. Are you doing that work yourself? Or are you hiring a, a contractor to do that? What's that look like? 
Well, in the beginning, you know, with resources, low, well, I started this business in 2007. I've been in real estate for longer than that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll just talk about the mobile home part. Um, so yeah, it's been a while, 2007. My goodness, this brings back memories. But yeah, in the beginning, I did everything. I cleaned the home, I painted, you know, I did everything to fix up the home. But as the business grew and, you know, the cash folks started coming in, the income started coming in, then I started hiring contractors, you know, little by little. So now I'm at the point, there are still some things that I do, like if I need to do some, like I'm working on a mobile home fix up right now, I'm going to do a little bit of touch ups here Mm -hmm. and there, but I'm not going to do anything like I'm not going to install cabinets myself or install flooring, or I don't even paint the whole house anymore. I have painters who do that. Uh I just had my cabinet guy, he just finished with the kitchen cabinets and I was on the phone with my flooring guy today to have them go ahead and start the flooring work for the home. It's almost done to be put on the market. So as of now, I do have contractors and I advise anyone who is, you know, getting into real estate or is already into real estate, start little, you know, with your resources, learn how to do things. But as you grow and you acquire more property, you're not going to be able to do everything. Um, Because it did get to that point where I had so many properties and I had to fix them up and there's no way I could have fixed them up (laughs) myself all at the same time. So yes. So now I do have uh, contractors to help me out with the fix up work. With contractors or anyone working in the place, is that different than someone you would hire for a house? It it just seems like some of those skills may not be exactly the same. Yes. Most times the contractors I use, they're already familiar with mobile homes, manufactured homes. They already work with the park or they, their customers are already in the park. A lot of my contractors, I think for the majority of my contractors, they do work on mobile homes. And then they also do other types of asset classes, like a, like my flooring guy, he does all the apartment buildings, but he also does. We have a long history. Ever since the beginning, I've been working with some of these people. They do mobile homes. And I would advise people who want to get into mobile home investing that you want to work with people who are familiar with the asset class that you're working with. So whether that be mobile homes, single family homes, apartment buildings, just because in terms of supply chain and also where to get parts or how to do something, you don't want someone learning on on your dime. You want them to already be familiar with it. And the best place to get uh, referrals for contractors for me is the mobile home park managers or the mobile home dealerships, people who are already working in the industry because they've got their own homes or customers that need homes to be fixed up to. Just to go back to something kind of basic, I've, I've heard you say it a few times is uh, mobile home and uh, sorry, what was the other one you said? Manufactured home. Manufactured home. And, and another one I've heard and I don't think it's exactly the same, but maybe it's similar as modular home. Are are these all different things? Are they related? Yeah, well, the mobile home is is the term that everyone's familiar with. Manufactured homes, there are people who like to refer to mobile homes as manufactured homes. So it really depends on what they're referring to. But a lot of times the people who refer to mobile homes as manufactured homes are thinking about the ones that actually look like real home, like single family homes that are brand new, you know, in the showroom. But either terminology you can work with for mobile homes or manufactured homes, in my opinion. I mean, some people have their own... (laughs) Yeah. opinions about that. But in terms of modular homes, those are completely different and they're in their own asset class. For me, I don't work with uh, modular homes. I work specifically with manufactured homes or mobile homes. Okay. Thanks for clearing it up. Cause I, I hear all these words that aren't house and <laughs> right. I, I, I don't know which one's which. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's the one thing about mobile homes. Another advantage, apart from the competition, the less competition is that they're mobile, mm. obviously. But basically, I've never seen a single family home being moved down the freeway. The mobile homes, you can either have them sit on that lot or piece of land, or you have the option, you'd have to get a mover. Um, you know, jack it up, put the axles and the tires on, put the hitch back on, 
and then move it to another location. And I've done that several times too. I've moved mobile homes. (laughs) Yeah. From one piece of land or another uh, mobile home park community to another uh, mobile home park community. So, I mean, I've done it a lot of times. There's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So if someone's interested in mobile home investing, I would just stick with in the beginning, just getting the experience, buying the homes, leaving them in that location. Mm -hmm. And then maybe down the road, when you get a little bit more experience, then move them. So it's there's a lot involved with moving mobile homes. Is there anything specific someone needs to know when they're even just looking to get into this? Like, where would you find these? I looked here here in Canada, uh, realtor.ca does have them. It's a separate little checkbox you can check. But we have other websites here in Canada, big name websites that mm-hmm. pull off the real estate information that don't include them. And I was on one of those originally and I was thinking, well, where are these? Where, where I can't find them. And, and then when I went to realtor.ca, at least I was able to uh, to find a few that were in the area. Right. Well, I actually did things the old fashioned way, Tom. I went into the field and I looked, I got a list of mobile home communities in my area and I'd visited, it was crazy, over 200 mobile home parks oh. when I first started out. From there, what I did, um, because another barrier to entry is being able to work in these parks because you don't own the land, the mobile home community does. So you've got to go in, establish the relationship with the park manager or the owner, and then just make sure that they're okay with you working in their community. So once I did that, then I started looking for opportunities in those specific communities, in those specific parks that I work with. And I will tell you, since I've been doing this for so long, a lot of the homes that I actually buy, they never even hit the market. A lot of them are referrals from the park managers, mobile home dealerships, contractors who, who work on mobile homes just because I've built the relationship with these people. So I don't do that much in terms of, you know, marketing and looking at, you know, online sites um, and all that. It's a lot of it is just net pure networking from, you know, the people that I know who work in the business every day. So that's just how I do it. I mean, there's different ways to do it. So I was going to ask you actually what you meant by choosing a community like so is that what that is like getting that relationship and and being able to work in that and and when you say work in that do you mean just the fact that you're doing business or the actual uh you're in there and, and fixing things yes basically and i do cover this in my podcast episode eight uh working with park managers basically how do you approach it? How do you approach a park manager going into the office or a park owner going in there and to create that relationship? And I will say it does take time. It's not going to happen overnight. A lot of people who try to get into this, they want to do everything remotely. They send emails to the managers or the owners. They, you know, call them on the phone. It does not work. You have (laughs) to go in person. So it is definitely a people business. I can tell you that. How many of these communities are you working with right now? Because it seems like you would spread yourself too thin then if you're like, I've got one mobile home here and another here. And do you try to keep it to a a set amount? Yeah, I've got a a really low amount of communities that I work with because a lot of the parks that I work with, they are actually, um, a lot of them are corporate owned. So they have sister parks. So I just got into a park recently because one of the assistants who I knew before, she became the park manager, and I've been trying forever to get into this park. And this specific park has a thousand lots. So that's enough business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and then another one, it's a sister park, it has over 500 lots. So I don't have to be working like with a hundred mobile <laughs> parks. In the beginning, I thought that I'd be working more with small mom and pop type parks, but really the way that things were run in those types of parks and the clientele, just the specific parks that I visited, it's not going to be across the board. It's going to be dependent on the community. Just didn't work with my personality. And since I have a corporate background, I was an account executive. I did sales uh, for Fortune 500 corporations. 
my background is more in business and sales. So really meshes with my personality to work in these corporate owned parks because I just prefer how they do business versus uh, other parks that I've visited in the past. But that's just me. Everyone has their own, you know, this works for me, but this doesn't work for me. So it really depends on the person. In general, in the U.S., what's a mobile home sell for? Like, What's just a, an average price that you're paying? Well, it's going to depend on the area because I've heard from people that they go, they can go for a lot, especially on the coast, talking about California or New York. And I'm not in any of those (laughs) states. I'm in Texas. But for me, I pay anywhere between 10,000 and 15,000. And when I choose my criteria, I look specifically for three bedroom, two bath homes. I don't go any smaller. I used to do two bedrooms, but now I kind of pass on the two bedrooms because three bedrooms work better for me and the types of clientele I work with are larger families. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend. I'll be honest. It's going to depend. And then again, a lot of the the homes that I buy, they're not, they don't even hit the market. So (laughs) those prices sound amazing. And and yes, I know that in the U.S., things can vary widely. Like you said, if you're in California or something, that's mm-hmm. that's a whole different deal. But uh, again, just looking here, I was seeing anything. Granted, this is Canadian. So if if you say uh, fifteen thousand in the U.S., call it twenty thousand Canadian. Mm-hmm. Here, just in my small small seventy thousand population in Airdrie here. I was seeing anything from 80,000 to 285,000. I've heard. It, it kind of shocked me because for 285, getting in towards 300, you can get a house in this town So, and not pay the lease fee on top of that. So I was, I was a little surprised by the pricing. Uh, granted, we have different things going on in Canada too. We never really had a, a huge real estate price drop in 2009 and all that. So we've always just kind of kept going up, especially here in Alberta and, and right. Toronto and Vancouver as well. <laughs> Right. And I will tell you, I actually had, it just reminded me, I had a student, husband and wife couple in California. They bought a mobile home in a park for $4,000. Wow. It was an off-market deal. I believe it was either through internal marketing and talking with the park manager. So they got that home and it was a motivated seller. They were behind on the lot run, I believe. The only thing was the lot rent for the land was $1,000 a month. Hmm. So it was like, y'all need to fix that up right away (laughs) because (laughs) while you're fixing up the home, my deal is like I tell the park manager, the owner, I'll cover the lot rent. You know, it's empty until the new person comes in or the new family and then they will start covering the lot rent. And then if they get behind, then I will cover it Mm -hmm. since I do business in in the community. That's pretty much the deal. But that was the only thing, but they did get it for (laughs) $4,000. So they are out there. I just think that the way you find them may not be, you know, so easy as just typing it into a keyboard (laughs) and doing a search on the internet. (laughs) Yes, definitely. Cause I didn't see a lot. I think, uh, off the top of my head, I think I saw four in our entire city. We have two, two, uh, communities that I know of, uh, that, that have, uh, right. The mobile homes. So, and that is one thing about this business. I mean, I don't want to scare anyone, but it does take a lot of work in the field. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I learned as a real estate investor, you know, been doing this for so long is that anything I do, I have to do it to my personality. And I really enjoy talking with people, meeting with people. I do not like being in the office. I do not like just being stuck at a computer all day. So that's just my personality. So the marketing methods that I use work for me. I've met other people. They've had real good success with direct mail because you could do this with direct mail. You could do this cold calling. I mean, it just, it really depends on you and what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Like something that works for me may not work for someone else because of the personality. Mm -hmm. When you talk about cold calling and direct mail, do you mean to to just people in the park to see if they're interested in mm-hmm. selling? Mm-hmm. I know people who do that. It does take, you know, you know, there's that old saying, you got to hit them seven times. 
<laughs> with they've got to see your message seven times. It does take a lot of persistence and follow up. And if you're the type of person who can keep up with that, I am not, <laughs> <laughs> then it could work for you. Same thing with cold calling people who are mobile homeowners that could work for you. I mean, it's worked for other people. So I'm not going to say these other marketing methods don't work. It's just what works for me is really networking Mm -hmm. and talking with people, which may seem more involved than that, but it really depends. Like to me, direct mail. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That's something like, oh my gosh, that's so hard for me to keep up and, you know, track and, that just does not. And I have tried it. So it hasn't worked <laughs> for me. No, I, I should say that even though I found one as high as 285, I, I think I, I didn't actually calculate an average, but I, I would say the average was about 160. And right. while that still sounds like a lot compared to yours, if you happen to live in this area, you've got a job here and, and you, you're not already in a house or anything, it's, it's still that sort of starter home. Like someone's someone's going to value that. There's an opportunity for them, especially if it's through someone like you that gives them this lease to buy option where maybe they don't have the right credit score for a mortgage. Uh, maybe their income's not that high yet. So like there's a mm-hmm. lot of positives I could see where even at a much higher price right here, I don't know about the rest of Canada, but mm-hmm. it's still this entry point, which isn't available in a lot of other ways. Right. And I can say, I mean, this business is so people-based. You're really selling yourself, whether you work with the park manager, the park owner, people who want to buy the home, because it's all based on trust and it has to go both ways. I mean, you have to trust who you're working with and they got to trust you too. And you got to be genuine. One of the secrets to my success is I, I have to be open and I have to work with people who are honest and upfront as well, too. If I have a bad feeling about someone, it doesn't matter if they're selling me a mobile home and they're just asking, say, something really low, $2,000, and I bought a mobile home for $2,000 and it turned out to be a nightmare. But that's another story. It really depends on the person. Is this person honest? Is this person upfront? Because If not, and I have a bad feeling, no matter how good the deal sounds, it could hurt me in the future. And I really don't want to deal with that because then that's going to be more wasted time and more wasted energy in the future. And I've been down that road before, so (laughs) that's for sure. Well, thanks for taking us through all these steps. I I think it's very interesting. It's uh, if, If someone's looking at real estate investing, maybe they're not ready to invest in a full size house or they want to take advantage of the fact that they can get someone that is more likely to rent and they're more likely to stay there, (laughs) then I think this is a great opportunity that someone could look into. One quick question before I let you go is, you mentioned it's kind of a a niche thing. Is is it still sort of unknown? Like it it seems like there's a lot of talking to people and and it's Mm -hmm. it's not just on the real estate sites and everything. Yeah. I mean, this is basically one of those things like if you want to get into it, you just really have to research how it's done. And there's several books on the subject on mobile home investing. And there are mobile home investing investor communities around this. You just have to kind of get into it, so to speak. And then if you do decide to do it, you've got to look in your own community and and see what communities are out there for these mobile home communities. Where are these mobile homes sitting? Because you'd be surprised. They could be closer to you than you think. You just haven't been looking. Yeah. And then when you do look, you know, take the time to kind of research the market, get to know these communities and what's selling, what's not selling, and um, just start, you know, going from there and building up your network. And you mentioned at the beginning of the episode too, the eight mile perception that people have. And I had that too, long before the movie, it just seemed that anytime I knew someone there or something that they were in tougher financial situation. But then my, my aunt and uncle did the very Canadian thing of spending their winters in Florida and they were in this uh, retirement community that that was mobile homes, and and oh, like, oh this great. is actually pretty nice when I saw it. So, did they enjoy their stay there? Did, yeah, did yeah. they like it down they there? They bought a place yeah. there, and and it it actually works really well for snowbirds because uh, you don't have to buy the property; you're you're you're, you're renting mm-hmm. the property, and uh, so they're just buying the place. The way I understand it is, it gets around a few Florida laws uh, about Canadians. Uh, 
investing in real estate. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for walking us through all this. Can you let people know where they can find you? Sure. Um, the best way to find me is through my website, adventuresinmobilehomes.com. On there, I've been writing about my adventures and stories of mobile home investing since 2007. I also have a podcast. It's also called adventuresinmobilehomes.com, Adventures in Mobile Homes with Rachel Hernandez. And you can find it on there as well, too. And then one last thing, Tom, if you want to link, I have a book and it's also called Adventures in Mobile Homes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be really easy to find, but yes, we'll put it in the show notes as well. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel, for giving us a look inside your business and for shedding light on a type of investing that not a lot of people know much about. You can find the show notes for this episode at maplemoney.com slash 148. Are you new to the Maple Money Show? If so, I want to thank you for listening. In case you weren't aware, you can watch videos from many of our top episodes over on our YouTube channel. If you're interested, head over to maplemoney.com slash YouTube. Make sure to like the video and hit the subscribe button. I really appreciate the feedback I receive from my listeners, and I want to thank everyone that's taken the time to email me or share their favorite episode in a tweet. It keeps me motivated to keep bringing you new guests and great topics. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here next week.